Hello everyone and welcome to this tutorial. So today what I'm going to be talking about is custom events in JavaScript. So you're probably already familiar with a few inbuilt events like a click event or submit event on a form. But sometimes you may want an event to occur that isn't covered by one of the standard inbuilt ones. And you can do that by creating your own custom event. So the first step is to define your event by creating a new instance of the custom event object and passing in here the name that you want to give to your event. So in this example, I'm creating a game over event, which I will trigger after five seconds. Now in this options object that I'm passing in as a second argument to custom event, if I create a detail property here and I make the value of that an object, any properties that I store here, will be available when the event is triggered inside its event object. So for example, you could make a timestamp available indicating when the event occurred. You could also define a function here that belongs to the event itself and you can call when the event occurs. So I'll just log to the console for now, but I will return to this later in the example adding some appropriate logic. Now for completeness, it's also possible to define a new event using the event constructor in the same way that we used custom event, except that you can't pass in custom data via a detail property when using the event constructor, you can when you're using custom event. So we'll stick with custom event in this example. Okay, so the event is now defined, but it's not yet occurring. So to fire the event, we need to store a reference to the new custom event that we've just created because we trigger the event by passing the reference into a function. Now, before doing that, I just want to mention that in a real project, this defining of a custom event would be a really good candidate for importing from another script via JavaScript modules. So then you wouldn't be defining your custom event or events at the top of your script. Now, in this example, I'm going to keep the code as it is just for the sake of simplicity, but importing the event or events is something that you might want to consider. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, I want my game over event to fire after five seconds. So the logic for doing that is quite straightforward. I just need to embed the triggering of the event inside a set timeout that has a delay of five seconds on it. So to trigger the event, it has to be called on something. So you'll be familiar with this from standard inbuilt events, like a click, it occurs on a button, for example, or submit on a form, a custom event also has to be called on something. So if it's an event that is specific to a particular element in the DOM, then it would be appropriate to call it on that. It's more a kind of global event in this situation. So I'm going to call the event on the global window object and the method that you call to trigger the event, whether it's on an element or on the window object like it is here, is dispatch event passing in the reference to the event that you've created and want to occur. Okay, so now we're ready to listen out the event and respond to it. So we can do that by adding an event listener to the global window where the event is occurring. And when it does occur, this function that I'm passing in as a second argument will run. And I have available to me the event object, which has available on it, the custom data, which I defined on the event when I was creating it. But before accessing that, I want to respond to the event by displaying some text to the user letting them know that the time has elapsed. So I'll display it in this notes element in HTML. I've already selected it in JavaScript under the reference notes. So I'll set the text content of notes to times up in response to the event and also log to the console, the custom data belonging to this event so one of those is a timestamp and the action function that I defined, I don't actually have to 
console log that to see whether it's working because I'm logging to the console inside the function. Let's see if it's working now. If it is, then we should get the text appearing below the button and also in the console from the custom data, which we are the timestamp and also the log to the console from the action function. Now, one of the main advantages to using this pattern is that the event itself and the logic that triggered it is decoupled from the reaction to the event. So the logic for calling this event, it ends with me calling dispatch event and not by calling one or several functions by their names. So what this means is how I'm reacting to the event in terms of adding event listeners, listening out for it, doesn't change the code that I'm using to call the event. If I was calling functions to run by name, I can have to edit this code and specify the functions that I want to run. Here, I can just keep this code the same no matter how many event listeners that I add listening out for the event. So in this way, it can be a much more maintainable solution, especially if you have lots of functions that you want to respond to your event. So something else that I want to do in response to the event is to remove the event listener that I've set on the button because when user clicks that, it increases their score. And I don't want that to be possible after the time is up. So the event listener on the button is calling this update score function and I need to specify in remove event listener that is that function that I don't want to run in response to the event. And finally, I'll add an event listener that will call a function that belongs to the event itself. So for that, I'm going to be using the event object and we saw before how we can call the action function on the event. So I'll call it again here, but this time set it to perform a useful function. And that function will be saving the score to local storage. And I'm passing in some relevant values as arguments. So this is how you can make available to a function on the event object values that are defined after the event. So I still need to create a player ID value. So I'll do that here. And so now I'll have these two values that I passed in as arguments available to me, player ID and also score. And then instead of logging to the console, I'm going to set a new item in local storage. The key will be player ID underscore. And then I'm going to use the timestamp that I created on this object. So I can use this and the value for the item in local storage will be the player's score. And so that we can see that saved item directly afterwards, I'll retrieve that item from local storage. So I can just copy and paste this key that I saved it under. So let's see if this is working now. If it is, then after five seconds, we should see the score that's passed to the action function logged to the console. And this is coming from local storage after the value was saved there. The other couple of event listeners, one removes the event listener from this button, increasing the score. So that works and the times up text is still being printed to the page, which is the task of the first event listener. Okay, so now that we have a firing event and we're responding to it successfully, let's talk about some options that you can add to your event. One of those is bubbles. So by default, it's set to false. If you set it to true, what it means in practice is that you can respond to the event on a parent of the element that the event is occurring on. So in our example, it's not really relevant because the event is occurring on the global window object and we're listening for it on the global window object as well. But if we set this event to occur on the button on the page, then if bubbles was set to true, then we could respond to it, listening for it on a parent element 
or the global window object, you can set a composed property. So this is similar to bubbles, but it's allowing you to respond to an event in the main DOM occurring in the shadow DOM. So you only need to worry about this option. If you're working with a shadow DOM, the final option that I want to show you is cancelable. So this is there to help you cancel some kind of default action that your event performs by calling the prevent default method on the event object when you are responding to the event. And it helps you to do that by setting a default prevented property to true on the event, but it's not magic. So you have to work with that value manually to prevent a default action. So a typical pattern for doing this is to embed the creation of the event inside a function. And then instead, of dispatching the event inside the set timeout, you would call this function where you define the event and also dispatch the event as well. So it's still the same process of defining and dispatching the event, just that it's happening inside this function. Now, because I've set the value of cancelable to true, this means if prevent default, is called in response to the event, then the default prevented property on the event will be true. And I only want to do something here if prevent default was not called in the event listener. So I'm going to make the default event what I was doing here inside the action function. So I'll delete the action function because we don't need that anymore but I still need these values. So I can get those by passing them in to this function when it's called. And I can get the timestamp from the event object via the detail property. And then down in my code, instead of calling the dispatch event here, I'm actually going to call the game over, which is now a function and pass into that player ID and score. And because the saving of the score is now happening in the event itself, I don't need this event listener here at all anymore. And I can now control whether that saving, which is effectively a default event for the event now occurs via prevent default. So if I call that and we wait five seconds for the event, you see that nothing is being logged to the console, which would have occurred if the default saving action had run. Now, without prevent default, you see it's running again. Now, one more important thing that I want to mention and finish up with is how errors are handled. So if there's an error inside this first function, which will run first because it's first in the code, then this next function of the next event listener will run, even though there was an error in the first one. So this might be the behavior that you want if the responses are independent processes, but sometimes you might want an error in the first function to trigger the second one not to run. So you can set up that behavior by creating an errors array and then back in the event listener functions, push errors if they occur into the errors array. So if there is an error in try, catch will run, and you can push that error into the errors array. And then in the function that you don't want to run before it performs its action, then you can check if the length of the errors array is greater than zero. If it is, then you know that there's been at least one error. So you can just pass the errors into the new error object, or you can pass in just the error messages in array format using map. So the return value here should be the error message from each error. So I'll create an error here. So when we run this code, we should get the errors that occurred logged to the console 
just one in this case, so not, not defined. Now, if I go back and change this so there is no error, there shouldn't be, the event listener should stop working after the five seconds is up. So this is how you can make the running of an action in a later handler function dependent upon whether there was an error or errors in earlier handler functions. And so that is it for this tutorial on custom events in JavaScript. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please consider hitting the like button down below this video. It helps us with the algorithm and others to find this video. And if you'd like to see more content like this from us in the future, don't forget you can subscribe to the channel.